Okay. Hi, everyone. Okay, so today is November 20, 2023, and we're doing a little bit of review based on what, what I've seen uh, during the labs and some on some of the evaluation uh, items like tests or quizzes. Uh, okay, excuse me. <coughs> All right. So the first thing that I want to touch up on is the... Here it is, screwdrivers. I have noticed that uh, some of us are using the wrong screwdriver heads with the wrong screwdriver footprints. All right, so let's uh, take a look at some of the screwdriver heads and footprints. Make sure you use the correct one with the correct one. All right, so. As a review, this is a slotted screwdriver screw, slotted screw footprint. Quite often, you're going to hear people say uh, flathead. Let them, okay? Um, on the construction side, you're not going to say, oh, you know, this is, shouldn't be called slotted, flathead, it should be called slotted, okay? Yes, I know. Just don't correct people uh, like crazy here. I mean, uh, you, you know they mean flathead. Can you give me a flathead screwdriver? Just give them the slotted screwdriver. That's what they mean, all right? But just so you know, okay? So this, uh, well, it just happened to be the one, but, um, but this is the shape of the screw that is flathead. It's just a coincidence that on this picture, it's like that. As opposed to, a mushroomed head like this here. See that? This screw head is in the mushroom shape. And this screw here, the screw head shape is in the shape of a flat head. Sometimes you want to use one, sometimes you want to use the other, but the flat head term is reserved for the screw head shape. All right, not the screws footprint, which this one is Robertson or square. And this one happens to be slotted. Okay, so that's what the slotted screwdriver looks like. Right here, slotted screwdriver head and screwdriver footprint. Then we go to that little X thing. Now, don't be deceived because there are some other shapes of kind of an X y shape, uh, but uh, just a straight X, that's the Phillips. If there are some notches and other things around it uh, or different little bit of a different shape, still of an X, but it's not straight kind of thing, it would be some other type of a uh, screwdriver uh, footprint or screw footprint, all right? Match the footprint with the screwdriver head. This one is straight X or across. Mark, make sure that this thing is nice and straight here. It should fit. Once you put that thing in, the, the, the uh, screwdriver head into the screwdriver, into the screw, it should fit nice and snug, and so you should be able to turn it uh, without struggling uh, in order to make a proper connection. Right. Then here is the Allen screwdriver head and a footprint. One, two, three, four, five. Pentagon type of a one two, three, four, five corners here. Match that with this. Next one here is, it's called Torx. Usually, you know, the different screwdriver, why do we have so many different ones? It depends on the uh, uh, production lines. Some of the production lines, uh, like for example, uh, this here, this Torx, um, it's really friendly with the machines that are assembling things. Uh, so when there's a screwdriver head on some sort of a swivel or mechanism, it just dips into that and it picks it up with the screw and then just mounts it on whatever the uh, you know whatever place it needs to be. All right. But uh, here now the Torx sometimes is um, accompanied with a little like a pin sticking from right in the middle, right there, just so you can't use that with the regular Torx screwdriver. 
This will be called the security torques, uh, used in some of the security cameras or security equipment, just so somebody, well, you, you can bypass everything. Don't assume that just because you have a security system or something, nobody can mock with that. Yes, anything and everything can be bypassed. So, uh, you know, but uh, you know, things are being installed uh, for the reason of uh, deterrence uh, and, you know, making things difficult. And sometimes it is possible that the person who is recorded on the video can be caught, you know, more often than not, All right? So, <clears throat> uh, so as far as uh, the, you know, sometimes you will have this, uh, you will see those, Things with the pin, they called security screws. They are called security screws, and of course, that accompanied with the Torx screwdriver with the uh, you know, with with the hole inside, so the pen can go into the hole. So you can actually insert this whole screwdriver into the screw, and you can use that uh, that system that way. All right. Uh, then the last but not least, these are just the most common types of uh, screwdriver screw footprints, and this is the called square or or robertson robertson screwdriver or robertson screw head now let's just take a quick look at uh, some of the it's just the robertson and um mm, phillips we're going to look at we're going to look at robertson and phillips sizes all right the most common sizes and you already have this uh in the posted lecture notes we're just going to we're just doing some review because i noticed that some of us are uh, you know not choosing the proper screwdriver heads with the proper it's important that uh, that you use that we use the proper tools for the proper job and that's you know if if you have the wrong footprint i mean if if you have a certain footprint of a screw and then you use the screwdriver head that's not matching that you won't be able to get enough oomph or enough torque or you won't be able to make that connection uh, properly right? or comfortably. All right, so um, let's see here. Robertson screws, which would be the square ones right here, all right? The most common ones, and I just put little check marks uh, when you were gathering your tools that uh, it would, would be a good idea for you to have in your stash when we are working on our labs. So they go by colors, like for example, the, the Robertson screwdrivers, okay? They go by colors and they go by number. All right, so as far as the colors, red and green, these are the most common ones that you're going to, to use. In fact, uh, for example, Mm, this the mounting screws that we have used to mount the 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 wood screws that we have in our closet there uh, they use the red Robertson which of, it is of a certain size of the footprint because the footprint has a shape and it also has a size so the there will be the red which is called number two Robertson or number two square fits the size of the screws, eight, nine, and 10. Now, when it comes to green Robertson, which is number one, which is slightly smaller size of the footprint, uh, it would fit screw sizes five, six, and seven. Now, remember when, uh, when we were doing the three-way switch and some of the switches were missing the screws that... Uh, will help us mount the device or the switch in that case onto the utility box. I said, I, I, I kept saying, just go to the closet right on the door. There, there are some bins, yellow bins, and use the screw that's labeled 632. So the size of the screw would be six and the 32 would be the pitch or the density of the thread. So and it would be the machine screws. So, um, um, so that, for that one, you would use the green Robertson if you haven't noticed. Right? Try it sometime, next time we're going to be in the lab, try some of the screwdrivers and fit into the, you know, into the screws, all right? It's all there for you, all right? Okay, now moving on to the Phillips. They don't go by colors, but they go by numbers. So the most commons would be one and two. 
Oh, actually, you know what? One, two, and three are the most common ones. To be, uh, to be honest, you should have all three at least. <clears throat> all right. And these are the sizes of the shank diameter, shank diameter, and uh, these will be the screw sizes that they would fit. I would encourage you to investigate a little bit more on the screw sizes. We haven't covered that. Uh, this is not part of this curriculum. Maybe I should include that for the future years to have more content. However, um, well, right now I'm pointing you in the right direction. This is uh, you know, the field of technology is uh, never ending and never stopping field. You always keep learning. You always find it interesting. Uh, and well, technology is one of those things. Like for example, uh, well, history doesn't change. You know, if you study, although, you know, history can change as far as there could be some new information about something. So yeah, there's always something new to learn in every subject. Okay. Uh, all right. So as far as the sizes, yeah, okay. There, we're also going to cover the slotted screwdriver uh, sizes. The most common ones that we are, we should at least have in our stash when doing our labs would be, let's see, they don't go by the number one, two, or three, or the colors. They go by the, uh, well, they go by the blade width. See how wide is the blade, all right? And the most common ones that, to, uh, that we're going to use uh, ever in our lab uh, would be the 3 sixteenths of an inch and a quarter of an inch of the blade width. These are the most common ones. And there are some other tools, but we're not going, you know, we already talked about that. I just wanted to touch on the subject of using the proper footprints, the proper screwdriver's heads with the proper footprints. It is important. Right? You're either going to rip the, not rip, or you're going to damage the screwdriver head or you're going to damage the, um, you're going to warp the footprint. You're going to make the screw useless. Plus, you're not going to be able to make a proper connection if you mismatch those. Guys, girls, it's important. All right. All right. Next thing that uh, we're going to touch up on, and I just have to make sure that this thing is uploaded uh, for you to for you to partake of is the pigtails. Why do we use the pigtails? I already have given you the rundown on this thing when we were doing the labs. I gave you all this ex explanation, but this is just kind of to reinforce the knowledge that you have acquired uh, during the process uh, of producing the labs that we did, the pigtails. Why do we do the pigtails? Well, there are different reasons. Sometimes you're going to have to interconnect conductors within the device box, for example. Sometimes you're going to have to connect things that are already connected to another screw terminal. So you're not going to try to pack all of those three into one screw terminal. You should have one conductor going to the screw terminal. So that's how you grab those on. You make a pigtail and you just uh, run one wire sideways into the device screw terminal. You could also use which I not I'm not really encouraging you to use. You know, those, you see those little holes at the back of the receptacle assembly. These are called the backstabbing holes, uh, backstabbing connectors. Do not use that. Well, I can't tell you not to use that because it's still okay when you use that. But the reason why people choose not to use that is uh, because you don't know what the what shape the connector is in. Is uh, is this thing nice and good as far as uh, things not being bent out of shape inside? You don't see that. Uh, well, and you don't see the type of connection. You don't know whether the wire is stripped just for just the right length or is it maybe too short and it's just barely grabbing, that, that connector is barely grabbing that, uh, making connection with that conductor. This here, when you see the screw terminal, at least you can see things and you can see if there's any loose connection 
And if you see any problems, you can still correct it because it's right in front of you. Right? Now, for the pigtails, we have used, well, there's that new Wago thing going on, uh, the Wago type of connectors. Uh, well, some people like them, some people don't. And that's all I'm going to say about that. One of the most popular one ways of connecting the pigtails is using those twist-on wire nut connectors. Okay. They used to be called only, or well, sometimes they're still being used, morets. It's just a residue terminology that stayed from uh, the moret was the only company or the corporation that were producing those, same as Xerox for cop photocopy. And, uh, well, um, if you use the NMD90 cable, uh, sometimes some of the older electricians uh, and some of the new one, newer ones too, uh, they're going to use the terminology Romex. Can you get me some Romex cable? That's because Romex was the only company that used to produce the NMD90 cable, and it kind of stayed that way. Uh, some people keep saying that. So just so you know. Huh? Now, when it comes to the wire nuts or twist-on connectors or the morets, um, some people try to determine the size of those by looking at the colors. And here's the we're, we're a little bit of a problem. Uh, this is where a bit of a problem is with that kind of uh, trying to distinguish the size by the colors. If there was only one company producing those, yeah, you could just say, yeah, okay, those uh, orange ones are not as big as the yellow ones, and maybe the black ones are bigger than the yellow the, the yellow ones and so on and there are some of the red ones blah 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 okay now when everybody and their brother's dog is producing those then it is not really safe to assume that certain size are going to be a certain color because it depends on who produces that right and who releases things on the market so look at the box uh here when you buy this look at the specifications of that and we're just going to talk about in this in, in a second here now here is uh, $64 question, and you know, kind of not really a $64 question, but that's the figure of speech. All right, there's something wrong with this picture, and I'll let you kind of dwell on that a little bit as I'm explaining some things and see if you can notice what's wrong with this one here. What this? What's wrong with this picture? Okay, so while you're thinking about that, let's just take a look at quit sort of like a, you know, sort of maybe an anatomy of this thing. Here is the plastic housing of that wire nut connector or twist on connector. And this housing is PVC, sort of some PVC material, non-conductive. Right? It's, it's supposed to not conduct, so isolate things from other things. Right? Uh, and within, inside here, we have a metal insert, excuse me, <coughs> excuse me, um, and this is the thread. Now, um, some of us were struggling uh, because the wire twist on connectors are being used and reused and, uh, and so on. And in some cases, we have seen that metal insert where the thread is fall out. And uh, you could keep twisting it, keep twisting it, hoping that the thread is going to grab, but this thing just keeps twisting and nothing is grabbing anything because the thread has fallen out. That insert can fall out. All right? So make sure that uh, uh, that uh, I can see someone says, Steven said, damaged wires. Uh, that's, you're, looking, you're looking at the right direction. You're almost there, but it's not the particular, yeah, you're, you're in the right area there. Um, so, uh, and I'll tell you, you know, I'll tell you in a second what's wrong with this picture here. Now, here comes the answer. Look at this thing. Which way does it, does the wire nut twist in order to make a connection or to tighten the connection? It twists, it has the right, the, you know, the left or right, it's got the right type of a thread. And when you turn the screw or the wire connector, wire nut, or screw-on type of twist-on connector, you have to twist it in the direction of clockwise in order for this thing to make a connection with 
the conductors and tighten. If you're doing anti-clockwise or counterclockwise, you're going to loosen the connection and take this thing out of the picture. So in this case, clockwise would be, well, if you flip it around, it will be this way here. This way would go and tighten this wire nut would be tightening this way here. The wires inside are pre-twisted the opposite way. See, the wire nut will turn this way and the wires are pre-twisted the other way. Okay. I left it on purpose. So we could, because I can see always also that some of us are still struggling with the direction of the thing. The wires pre-twisting should be in, in the same direction that the wire nut tightens. Otherwise, if you try to tighten that wire knot onto these wires pre-twisted this way, which is the opposite, that you're going to untwist that by twisting the wire knot onto those wires. It's counterproductive. Right? You're not going to be able to make a proper connection. So always twist the wires or pre-twist the wires in the same direction that the wire nut is going to tighten the connection. Like for example, here. All right, here's another example. All right, the wire nut turns clockwise, and the wires are pre-twisted clockwise. All right, if the wire nut tightens, this thread is going to make that twist even tighter. And that's what we want. Also, aside from pre-twisting or not pre-twisting, some of the even some on some of the boxes, you're going to say, they're going to say uh, the spe the specs will say no pre-twisting necessary for that one. Here's what I have the problem with: is that if you have more than three wires. If you twist them, or if you don't pre-twist them, there's a chance that there's going to be one wire in the middle just being held by the other wires that surround it. And that's the only hold it's going to have against the whole system. It's not going to make contact with the thread. And what happens when that happens? Well, just think about it. Usually when you make this type of a connection, you are leaving that for years. You just twist that thing on, put the faceplate on, put the cover, and you use that, that whatever the device is, whatever the box or device box or can, and it's just you're not revisiting that for you know sometimes years and years. What happens during those years as time goes along? You know, there's a possibility that the temperatures go up and down because they vary over the years. In you know. And uh, when what happens to, to, to metal, especially when temperatures go up and down, the metal would expand and contract, expand and contract, expand and contract. So there's a slight chance that some of the connection could, could become loose. And we know what happens when collection, connection becomes loose. Uh, the load that is going to try to draw the current from that connection it's not going to ask if I could, can I have three amps? Or can I have five amps? Can I have nine amps? No, no, it's going to think what it needs to operate, which means it's going to try to push or pull the, the current out of a connection that is, well, partial connection, and which is going to cause that spot to heat up, all right? And when it heats up, it oxidizes. When it oxidizes, it has more resistance on connection. And then that causes more resistance, that causes more heat. It's just a vicious circle that keeps going up and up and up. And if you connect a load that is big enough to draw well enough current to well, it can draw actually enough current to start a fire. Right? Depends on what the load is. Remember during the last lab, I'm not sure which section it was. Uh, um, we looked at the uh, the receptacle that was, uh, you know, on the by our desks there, and you know, we looked at okay, what's the footprint of that? That's the footprint of a fifteen amp uh, 
circuit. The ampacity of that circuit was 15 amps, which means it can provide up to 15 amps of a current. Does it mean the current, when you, whenever you, whatever you plug into that, does it mean there's always 15 amps? No. It can produce, it can supply up to 15 amps. But if there is a device that is plugged into that outlet or that well, receptacle, and it only requires three amps, that's what's going to flow through that circuit. Right? So sometimes you can you can have a connection or a receptacle that is going to work for years on something small, like a desk lamp or whatever, a clock radio. But what if somebody decides to plug in a heater that requires way more current than just a desk lamp? Then uh, if there is anything wrong with that connection inside there, that's when it's going to show up. And yes, it actually can start a fire. Um, all right. Also, since we're here on this picture, may I point to you? Always trim. Remember, we're always trimming that. Trim the tip before you install the twist on connector. If you don't trim, there's a chance that one of those are going to stick longer than you're going to extend longer than the other ones, which means the thread is going to work on along its way. And as you twist that, it's going to tighten that way. And if there's anything longer, it can actually puncture through and protrude from this tip of the wire nut or the twist and connector. And it could, you could be having, we could be having a situation when uh, we have an exposed wire, right? Which is not a good situation. All right. Now, as far as the sizes and, uh, oh, this one has a free knife. Good. All right. Now, always read the box on the, well, whatever it is, read the instructions, read the manual, read the specifications. They're, they're posted for the reason. This one here says one size fits all. I don't know, but I would not. Uh, uh, I would not just assume that this is, of course, there's no anything that one size fits all. That's why there's that asterisk here. So it says one size fits all, one size fits all, but. And you got to find out what the but is, because there's always a but. All right, so uh, <clears throat> these are just examples of different uh, uh, twist on connectors that I have found uh, in our shop. And I just took, you know, so you see there's different colors, but those are made by different brands. Like this one here, is, I think it's made by Moret. This one here is made by Ideal. And these two, I don't know. But they are different colors, so don't go by the color unless they're made by the same brand, same company, and that company, that corporation, has decided that this color is that size, that color is that size, and so on. But uh, if you just have a bunch of those uh, stuck in a drawer, and uh, you know, you, you can just say, okay, this color is that size. <clears throat> so here is that insert metal insert. That's the thread. <laughs> And yes, sometimes it's missing there. So you just have to make sure that before you install that, that thing is there. One. Two, make sure that there is nothing stuck in that thread to prevent you from using this properly. What do I mean by that? If there's some wire that is stuck from previous installation, somebody took it off and just dropped it in the drawer, you won't be able to insert the wires that you're trying to connect into this cone because there is something already there. So just make sure that this thing is free of any obstacles for the wires to get in there. Right. Oh, come on. Where is my... There you go. Now, <clears throat> here is the little sticker on this box right here. I just took a picture and I took a closer. See, this is our shop, right? Um, Okay, so what does this box say on this, on these type of connectors here? Here's the asterisk, and they're always, oh, is this now, okay, is this an asterisk, or is it just like a bullet, uh, uh, like a bullet point text? I think it's a bullet here. Listed as a pressure type wire connector, ooh, okay, for use on solid and or stranded combinations. 
Mm. All right. So here, there's one type of connection here that's just solid only. And yeah, these could be solid and stranded combinations. However, as you go along, you will probably find out, or some of us found out already, is that uh, trying to combine solid and stranded conductors could be challenging, to say the least. Problem is that the stranded conductor will have tendencies to wrap itself around the solid conductor, and you're going to have you know, a wrap around type of connection. And if you don't uh, wrap around by pre twisting, because you can't pre twist that, because uh, just, you know, you can, if, you know, yeah, you can. Uh, but uh, even if you don't pre twist, that thing is going to start wrapping around, wrapping itself around the solid conductor and the thread might actually cut some of the strands of the stranded wire. So, you know, uh, yeah, okay. Uh, all right, so what does this box say here? For this type of twist on connector, it says minimum three, and here's that hashtag or number 22, maximum three, hashtag 10. Okay, what does that mean? So you need to put in minimum of three 22 gauge wires. If you have anything smaller than that, then for this type of connector, this thread will be too big to actually grab onto something that's not as big. You will have, you just keep twisting and you will have a problem grabbing it. All right? Now, maximum three 10 gauge wires. Okay, so 22 is very thin because remember when the gauge number goes up, the wire becomes thinner. And the, if the gauge number goes down, here's 10 is lower than 22. That means the conductor becomes thicker, right? They are inversely proportional, right, those numbers. So maximum of three gauge 10 wires. If you, if you put anything more, then this thread would be too small to grab onto that bulky thing and you'll have a problem with making a connection. All right, so, and it says, and most applications in between, including, all right, one, two, three. From one to three, 12 gauge wires. You can have one 12 gauge wire and you can put the wire nut on and the thread size is going to be enough to grab that one connector. Why do you need that? Sometimes you need to isolate that one connector, making sure that touch it, you know, it doesn't make a connection with anything, right? So, you, uh, yeah. Uh, so, one to three 12 gauge connectors. And four to 12 solid only. Four, sorry, four 12 gauge solid only. Yes, yeah, in brackets here. And so on. You can have one, two, you can have five 14 gauge connectors in that blue wire knot that we have in our school, right there, those. Uh, you can put five 14 gauge wires, that's a lot. Well, don't put six because, well, the connector will have problem grabbing onto those wires because the thread size will be too small. And this is how we look at, uh, at some of those, right? some of the things. This is one of the better designed specifications, right, stuck right on the box right here. Uh, well, I can't zoom in because you know, it's not gonna show. Uh, all right, so that's as far as the pigtails. Oh yeah, just uh, I think, I, I don't think I have mentioned some of the reasoning. So yeah, I kind of got this distracted, I remember now. The reasons why I use that, we use to make sure that we have one wire going into one screw terminal. Also, Sometimes what you're going to encounter as you open some of the existing, as you as, as you deal with uh, some of the existing installations, you're going to find some of those wires really short in there and there's no more to pull down because maybe there was no service loop or maybe the service loop was already used or maybe it's stuck. Whatever the reason, those wires are too short. You can make an extension using a pigtail. Watch some of those videos here. It's uh, you know, how to make an electric. I think that's the video here showing how to extend those wires. All right. <clears throat> um, 
And that's, uh, yeah, I, I don't think I have mentioned that, uh, you know, it's being used for extending. So if there's one wire, it's too short to put on the, so you just put another wire, you know, just one to one, make a pigtail, and you have nice and comfortable length. All right, so that's as far as the pigtails. And then also, what I have noticed is that some of us are struggling still because I, I look at the, you know, by the text. Now, let's see, where do I have that? I have my little jig set up here. There we go. It's this here. All right, that's from the previous class. It is this here device. Can I zoom it in a little bit? There, that's better. All right, it's the analog meter. Some of us are still struggling with reading that. So let's just go over a couple of examples. What I can do with this one here is I set it up. I set it up. Sorry, I'm moving away from the mic. Um, is that I can move this needle here. Uh, thank you, Photoshop. All right. So let's say I'm going to leave the same range. Let's say the range of the 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 the, the the dial of the meter or the selector switch of the meter is pointed to a range of 500 on the quantity of the voltage. So the quantity we're measuring is voltage, DC, and the range is selected. So it's a switched range meter. We are on the range 500. So if it's a DC voltage, 500, that means with this meter as it is set up. At this point, we can measure voltages up of up to 500 volts. Okay. So, you know, now, now let's see if we could swing the needle somewhere here. Okay. That's a good swing out of the needle. Now, what scales do we use? Here's a DC voltage or AC voltage or milliamps in black right here. So any of those three can be used for DC voltage, right? Right, okay. So let's say we have a range of 500. Which scale would we choose? Well, let's say if we could use the scale, choose the scale of 50. Because here's 500, here's 50. We can quickly, remember what we do is we throw the range on the scale. Just like if you're going to the store and buy a bag of, pot no, well, loose bulk potatoes, they have to be thrown on the scale. So we think we throw things on the scale. This is the scale that we have chosen from zero to 50. So the scale of 50. And this is the range that we're set up with. And this is the swing out of the needle. So throw the range of the, on the scale. Remember, throw the range on the scale. First thing we have to do. So we throw the range, which is 500. Oh. Here. Which is 500. There we go. That's the range. 500. We throw that on the scale. So which scale are we using? We're using 50. Okay, so throw the range on the scale. All right. What do we get from that? That is going to give us 10. All right. Now, 10 is our multiplier right now. What does that mean? That whatever this needle shows on whatever scale, well, on this particular scale, actually, it's going to be just a number until we multiply it by the multiplier. Throw the range on the scale. Throw the range on the scale. Get a multiplier. Whatever it shows on that scale, we have to multiply by 10 to get the true reading. Okay, so let's, let's do it. Throw the range on the scale. Throw the range on the scale. We got 10. Now, what does the needle show on the scale of 50? All right. So we have 0, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50. So that means here 40. So this here in the middle between 40 and 50. See, here's 40. 
here's 40, here's 50. In the middle is going to be 45. Let's see what the smallest division is in this particular scale. It's supposed to be 45. Okay, let's do it by one. One, two, three, four, five. Yeah, okay. So the smallest division represents one. So what does the needle show on this scale? 40, one, two, three, four, 44. Okay. So this number shows 44 and multiplied by the multiplier, 44. By 10, it's 440 volts. That's what the meter shows. 440 in this case. All right. Now we have changed, we are not changing anything. The power supply is still the same, hasn't changed. The the, the 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 leads are being connected at the same point. We haven't touched the switch, the selector switch. We still have the range of 50. Let's see if we get the same reading if we choose another scale and apply the same method that we just used. Okay. So remember we had the 440, right? 440 volts. 440. All right. There, 440 volts. DC. Okay. All right, so let's choose different scale and see if we can come up with the same number. So I'm going to erase that here. All right. Let's choose the range of the scale of well, 250, okay. <clears throat> can we do the 250? Can we do the 250? Yeah, we can. What is the multiplier that we're going to get? Throw the range on the scale. Uh, pen, here. 500 over 250. Throw the range on the scale. Throw the range on the scale what's the multiplier it's going to be two so whatever we get whatever number we get we're gonna to have to multiply it by two all right so now we're using same black division marker but we're using the top scale, so 0, 50, 100, 150, 200, 250. So somewhere in here has, had to, has to be 225 because 2, 250, that's got to be 225. So let's see what the smallest division represents on the scale of 250. If this here is 255, so 225, because here 225 times 2 is 250. Uh, I mean, 25 times 2 is 50 at 200 is going to be okay. So that has to be 250 right here. Sorry. It has to be 225. So let's see if we count by 5 5, 10, 15, 20, 25. Yeah, okay. So we have determined that the smallest division represents 5 on the scale of 250. So what is this needle showing us as a, just a number? 200, 5, 10, 15, 20. 220, that's just a number until we multiply it by the multiplier. 220 times 2, it's 440 volts. Same thing. Of course, it's the same thing. Nothing has changed. All right, the, uh, the 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 voltage that we are measuring is still the same. The range that we have selected is still the same. We are just using different scale, but using the same method. And you can you can you should be able to get the same number if you apply the scale of ten. I will leave you with that. All right, I want you to know how to use an analog meter before you leave our school. <laughs> All right, and if you don't. If you still are struggling with this thing here, talk to me in private. I will help you with that. All right. Okay. 
Cool. So tomorrow we're going to do some more reviews. We're going to talk about some of the, well, the assignment is still going on. And I can see that, you know, every year is the same thing. So don't worry, you're not the only ones. Some of us are, uh, you, know, ha you know, having a bit of a struggle as far as presenting the information, presenting the assignment in the proper way. I also want you to, to be comfortable with that kind of stuff. As I said to the other class, the point is not for me to be the tough guy trying to be tough on marking things. There's only one thing I'm interested in, all right, is that once you leave this school, once you leave our program, you possess a certain type of knowledge, all right? So talk to me tomorrow. We'll just spend some time on analyzing the assignment. Maybe I'll show you some four-way switch as well because you know, we're doing this three-way switch. But I'll show you how easy it is to actually make a four-way switch system out of that three-way thing. But let's talk about the assignment tomorrow. Just because you got, you know, the, the whole thing is not done yet. The deadline is not finished. So if you get a low mark, talk to me. I'll set you straight with some of the you know, some of the information and you can do it again i just want you to be able to be comfortable with producing that type of stuff All right cool so that's it for today and i uh, will see you tomorrow in person thank you very much guys and girls <laughs>